Uh, it's now my, uh, my pleasure to um, wrap up by inviting uh, Bob Metcalf to come and deliver a final keynote for us, um, whereupon I'll join him for 10 minutes and then we'll have a quick uh, Q&A from the floor and then we'll go for lunch. So, Bob Metcalf, ladies and gentlemen. Good. I'm a little nervous about calling this a keynote, so if you don't mind, I'll sit down and that'll lower expectations. So the, um, let me begin by uh, thanking uh, the Computer History Museum and PARC and MEF and Net Events for uh, pulling all this together uh, in this celebration of the 40th. Of course, it was the intention all along that it would be more than a celebration of the 40th. Uh, I'm now a professor of innovation, so I thought it would be useful if we uh, collected, gathered some lessons uh, from the Ethernet history about how to innovate. I thought it would be fun, uh, we all thought it would be fun to sing some of our unsung heroes, because many people have invented Ethernet. And then we thought it would be good to have a party, and we had one of those last night. Strange party, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, I knew almost everybody there. That's strange. Usually I'm just in the corner and I don't know anybody, but this is amazing. And then uh, these industry briefings, because, because even though Ethernet is 40 years old, it is not dead. And apparently it is blooming, it is blossoming, and so there's a, something like a $100 billion industry for us to pay attention to, and, and that's what we're doing today. Uh, and here's some evidence that the Ethernet, whatever Ethernet is, it is not dead. And here are some of the ways in which it is not dead. We heard from uh, Aaron Dunn earlier today that the traffic now being carried by carrier Ethernet between carriers and their customers now exceeds all the legacy access methods before, more than private line, more than T1, more than ISDN and frame and ATM, et cetera. And that that, and you saw her chart, it's not only has it passed all the legacy, it keeps, it's going up like this. Uh, we, we also, I asked uh, Nan to qu quantify the, what's happening at uh, MEF, and he had some numbers at hand. This year there'll be $70 billion worth of carrier Ethernet equipment and services sold, they expected to be $100 billion by 2017. And then I hope you've all heard of the Verizon news today. So on this very day, or maybe it was yesterday, uh, Verizon announces the simultaneous availability of 120,000 new office buildings with gigabit Ethernet fiber service uh, under Fios. Uh, but wait, there's more. The MEF has uh, today introduced it, or this week introduced its new, its uh, a new committee, uh, the Operations Committee, whose purpose is to speed the provisioning, and this is the way I put it, to speed the provisioning and and um, settlements among multi-carrier networks. In other words, to, if you want to connect to all your offices around the world, you can't do it through one carrier. You've got to go through multiple carriers, and that needs automating and speeding, and, and uh, MEF is taking that up. So merely having that, as Nan put it, you know, we have too much Ethernet now. It's a problem. We have to learn to manage it better. Um, uh, but wait, there's more. We also heard the formation of the uh, Cloud Ethernet Forum, a formation and its association with MEF. Well, that's great news. That's more of the, that's sort of one of the new challenges, uh, one of the new killer apps of uh, the, the Internet's plumbing is to support cloud, uh, cloud computing, and, and uh, it's a very positive sign that a group of industry, uh, significant industry players have formed to pursue, uh, to sort that out, uh, that new killer app, the cloud. Um, and then I, in a previous panel, we, we worried about whether all this networking was going to become a commodity. Do you remember that? Well, and wasn't it like a problem? It was put like a problem that it would all become a commodity. It's our goal to make the Internet a, a, a commodity, to make Ethernet a commodity. In 1984, when I was on the public roadshow taking my company 3Com public, all the press and analysts uh, wanted to know, uh, you know, were warning us that the 3Com sale of Ethernet was about to be commoditized. This is in 1984. And that, uh, you know, basically our company was doomed because the commoditization was just around the corner. Uh, 
Well, they were really wrong about that. So 3Com hit f $5 billion in sales in 1999, a few years later. Uh, more importantly, it, it was our goal to lower the cost and make it invisible. You want your networks to be cheap and invisible, and we, you know, we've gone a long way toward succeeding at that goal. What they also didn't notice, that even though our prices for Ethernet were going down exponentially, our costs were going down even more exponentially. So I remember gross, gross margins at 3Com were going up during the commoditization of uh, the Ethernet NICs in those days. Uh, but wait, there's more. So we just heard about HP uh, results were just announced, financial results, and the stock took a big jump up, and it was entirely because of the 14th straight quarter of uh, robust growth in the networking division, which contains what company? What company is part of HP networking? That would be 3Com, yes. And uh, I actually I cornered Bethany uh, Mayer and got her to actually say that the, to me, and then I asked permission to tell you that 3Com is the most successful acquisition that HP has ever made. And, uh, So I'm pushing, you know, the HP are the initials of the uh, founders. And now my company is sort of part of that. So I'm pushing to have HP renamed, you know, HMP. No, that's not so. Uh, so another thing we were doing uh, uh, um, uh, yesterday and today, and especially last night, was singing our unsung heroes. And there are a lot of unsung heroes in this 40-year-old enterprise. Uh, of course, last night we voted Andy Bechtelsheim the most recent top hero of the day. And wasn't he graceful and smart? And Judy Estrin was there, and Henry Samueli, and Yogan Dalal, and Bill Hawes, and Dave House. Radia Perlman, who sat at this chair, I, I had, it's been so long I'd forgotten what a delight she is. She, you know, she will not let go of any detail and uh, even though something's a kludge, if it works, it's okay with her. And so she was, uh, and I remember uh, her coming up with spanning, the spanning tree algorithm, a key, a key development in the evolution of Ethernet. Norm Abramson was here, um, uh, the inventor of Aloha Network from which uh, Ethernet was derived. That was Pat Thaler was here. Uh, Pat and Jeff Thompson, both heroes of the IEEE standardization effort, they were here. Howard Charney was here. Is that, do you all know who Howard Charney is? Yeah, he's relatively unsung, but uh, you know, a bastion of our community at 3Com, at, at uh, Grand Junction, and now at Cisco. Uh, Glenn Rick Ricard Reichert is here, right there. Another uh, one of the heroes. Uh, and I'll return to uh, Ignite in a moment. Uh, Bob Belleville was here, now he's unsung. Uh, he's the guy who, with Steve Jobs looking over his shoulder, took Ethernet on this slight um, divergence to a thing called Apple Talk, and it took years to talk Apple back uh, up into Ethernet. Of course, now they're taking it out again. Well, they're filling it up with uh, what I call wireless Ethernet. I think the rest of you call it Wi-Fi. Uh, uh, Belleville was here. Uh, Gordon Bell was here. John Schock. I'm, I've added Dan Pitt to the list of Ethernet heroes, although he was a token ring guy. Uh, he's one of the better token ring guys. And, uh, uh, and now he's, uh, he's championing uh, this software-defined network thing, sort of. Although Andy Buckdell, oh, that's another beautiful thing about the Ethernet enterprise is how fiercely competitive it is and how snarky uh, the compet You remember, you know, Ju Juniper was being snarky with Cisco, and we were being snarky with, there was uh, Andy Bechtelsheim was sort of disparaging open flow, and that's, that is just so Ethernet-y. Uh, uh, of course, after we, you know, we're unified by token ring, but then as soon as uh, that was gone, then we turned on each other. That was, uh, uh, so, so I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm a professor of innovation, and I really am looking for lessons uh, to profess, and professing innovation is a tough job, but you know somebody's got to do it. <laughs> I guess one of the problems is is everybody's doing it. Uh, innovation is, I mean, 
every politician in the world that travels around promoting innovation. Innovation is now one of those unfortunate buzzwords, you know, like SDN, uh, innovation. What, what is it? Uh, but let me make some observations about the innovation process. Uh, we, for example, there is this, this, a short form of the story of Ethernet. It was born in the ARPA net community supported by ARPA, a government agency, at universities, in my case, MIT, Harvard, and Stanford. Then Xerox Park took over and supported it for a very long time, and it blossomed. That's sort of where it, quote, got invented. Then VC stepped in to create a, a, an, an Ethernet, several Ethernet companies. Then the uh, strategic partners uh, formed up with the venture-backed uh, venture startups, those DEC, Intel, Xerox, HP, Siemens, NEC, all joined in that early consortium to uh, promote this new innovation. And then, of course, there are the early adopters. I always mention the early adopters. You know, those are the customers who buy stuff from startups. And, uh, you know, I took Ethernet to Germany, and they asked me what part of Siemens I was from. And when I, went to N when I went to Japan, they asked me, did I work at NEC? But when I was in the United States, I could sell Ethernet cards to major US corporations. God bless early adopters. Uh, they, they help feed the innovation process. We need to cherish them. Uh, and then there's a, another observation is the role of the Ethernet brand. There is very little agreement about what the word Ethernet means. Uh, some people think it means CSMA CD on half inch coax running a 2.94 megabits per second with 8 bit addresses over a kilometer. And any departure of that spec, it's not Ethernet anymore. Uh, obviously, we don't subscribe to that here. Um, I think Ethernet has become a brand, and a brand is a promise, and what, it, and, and what Ethernet promises and why major US corporations use the Ethernet brand is it, you know, it has this model behind it, a model that seems to work, and we want to support the model and keep participating in it, and let me describe that short motto, model. So the brand communicates uh, a process which at its core has a de jure standard. So God bless the IEEE 802. Actually, God should bless 802.3, not four and not five, just three. Uh, all right, 802. And, um, and then there's the fierce competition that I've already mentioned, which is very much a part of the Ethernet model. As, you know, as soon as Ethernet was licensed to the World 3Com, bought a license to, uh, in order to buy and sell, uh, make and sell Ethernet, but so did 100 other companies in the same week. And, uh, and then we were off to the races. And that fierce competition is really can get unpleasant at times, but it drives things forward, and it's a, a part of this model. So when you have the Ethernet brand, you're expected to be sort of snarky on panels at conferences to, to your competitor to the right or left. Then there's the uh, interoperability ethic of the Ethernet brand. It used to be that standards had conformance. That is, the, what you would do is you'd write this standard, and then you would get everyone to conform, and then you'd build test equipment to test conformance. And what we learned is it doesn't work because of standards have too many options, so it's all too possible to be conforming and yet not interoperate with anybody else. And the Ethernet started at the very beginning with an interoperability ethic as opposed to a conformance ethic. And so there a whole conference was formed called Interop. And we went there with our cable, and we all, the cable ran across the, the, the convention center, and then we all tapped into it, and then we bragged to our customers how we were compatible with all the other stations on that network. That was interoperability, not conformance per se. And then another part of the brand is rapid evolution of the standard. I mean, we have, the point was amply made, there are many versions of Ethernet. Which one are we talking about? Well, that's sort of, some of that is uh, diversity of application, but some of it is the uh, unfolding of time, which causes new standards to be created. Uh, so the uh, rapid evolution of the Ethernet standard is certainly part of that brand, and yet there's this uh, uh, penchant for sticking with the install base. So uh, this law that I really like, called Metcalfe's Law, says that you know the value of a network goes as the square of its size. So when you introduce a new technology, do you abandon the install base? 
No, you invent things like auto negotiation that make you automatically compatible with the, the previous generation. So backward compatibility is an ethic of this Ethernet brand. Uh, let's see, I also, uh, in listening to the conference, heard some worry about the innovation process, because you remember in that the Ethernet model, the Xerox PARC, was all important. And uh, Mr. Spencer argued that uh, corporate research wasn't what it used to be. It was almost like PARC didn't exist. Of course, uh, of course it, I was just there, yeah, I'll be there this, you'll all be there this afternoon. So PARC is still there, but I guess what they're talking about is that the, like the massive Bell Labs, which had 25,000 employees, and the, the um, uh, Watson, and the, those are not playing the role they used to, and I guess the debate there is whether we should go back and create some more monopolies to create laboratories, because only monopolies can afford research laboratories, or should we do what I'm proposing, especially now that I'm a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, is we should do our research at research universities, which is my point of view. And why should we do research at research universities? Because students, and it's the business of universities to graduate students, is, uh, students are the best vehicles for innovation. They graduate and they take these ideas out into the world. And then we heard, let's see, we heard from Norm Abramson, who couldn't even remember whether he invited me to Hawaii in 1973. What, did he think I just got on a plane and I flew to Hawaii and I knocked on his door? Um, he invited me to come there and study the Aloha Network, and I'm forever grateful for that, even if he can't remember it. Uh, and he also taught me something. He thinks that Ethernet used coax because of the FCC. Did you hear him say that? Uh, well, I want you to know. I, I, I respect that he remembers it that way, but uh, the problem, the reason we couldn't use radio and Ethernet is we were going to go 300 times faster, and the radios he had were already this big. And we had to get our thing onto a card this big. So there was no chance of it being radio, whether the FCC gave us the frequencies or not. But it's interesting that he remembers that it was the FCC that was the obstacle. And I, I need to pry into that some more. Um, and that brings us to uh, uh, another question about technology. So you heard about CSMACD, which the IEEE officially removed from the standard, I think, last year. Roughly, is that right, Jeff? Two years more? Well, we changed. A couple, a revision or two ago, we changed the name of the standard from all the gobble, gobbledygook about CSMACD to what it should have been all along, which is standard for Ethernet. But was CSMACD actually removed from the technical part of the standard? Like, oh, no, 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 no. It's still in there. It's still there. Oh, yes. We have our backward compatibility. It's our ethic. It is our ethic. And besides, it's, it's a real pain in the neck to take anything out. <laughs> That's why it's six volumes and 4,000 pages. So here's the uh, trying to speak at an innovation theoretic level. Uh, CSMACD was one of two things. Either it was just a bad idea, it's the, sort of thing, it's the sort of thing a computer scientist comes up with when he's trying to solve a, a network problem. You know, just, it's just a bad idea. Actually, I think it's something different, if, if I may, Bob. Well, anticipate my second answer. Go ahead. Uh, communication systems, be they for matter or data, have a historical set of characteristics, and they start out half duplex when they require, when they're starting up and require outside investment. And then when they get successful and have enough traffic that they can fund their internal expansion, a railroad puts in a second set of tracks and goes full duplex. Yeah. And at that point, they no longer need access control. And Ethernet's the same way. Yeah, but let me add a, a third possibility, which is uh, memory was a penny a bit in 1973. So these big kahunking uh, hubs with all that memory, where the collisions occur in the memory, 
and not very often because there is so much memory, because memory is so cheap. That is a condition that did not exist in 1973. So the third alternative is that some technologies come and go because they're transitional. That is, we felt it was important in 73 to share the medium, but that turned out not to be so important when we had all the LSI in the world and all the memory in the world it all, and uh, much higher bandwidths, it all changed. But in a, from an innovation point of view, I think there are transitional technologies that come in and serve their role and then eventually they're replaced either because uh, we have the money or because the technology or the context or the applications have evolved. Uh, next is, is this build it and they will come ethic. So the Ethernet brand has this build it and they will come ethic. Do you know how we determined how fast Ethernet should be the first time? Was it because we had a marketing requirement spec that indicated that 2.94 megabits per second was exactly the bandwidth that we needed? No. The answer was the card was this big. And Dave needed uh, Boggs, who I think is here. There he is. He found a CRC chip to do a 16-bit CRC to check the packets, and there was room for it on the card, but where were we going to put the clock? There was no room for the clock. Oh, wait a minute. There's a back plane, and on the back plane is the system clock. Let's just use that clock. How often does it tick? Every 170 nanoseconds. But we're using Manchester encoding, which means each bit is two ticks. That means each bit is 340 nanoseconds if we use that clock. 340 nanoseconds happens to be 2.94 megabits per second. That's how we decided how fast it was going to be. And then going to 10, you may have heard yesterday there was considerable doubt about whether we really needed 10 and then 100. And then when we went to, somebody referred to good old classical gigabit per second ethernet. Well, when that came along, it was too much. Now 10 appears to be too much, 40 is too much, 100 is too much, terabit's going to be too much, and yet the Ethernet brand has gone forward. And uh, build it and they will come. And who will come? And this is where Ignite comes in. Who will come? Well, the new apps, the, the unanticipated apps that will be enabled by having all this new bandwidth. And of course, they only come with a little help. In the case of the internet, ARPA funded people to develop new apps for the ARPANET, and US Ignite is an uh, effort of the National Science Foundation to do pretty much the same thing, which is we're now gigifying the internet, and what new applications will be enabled? And Ignite is trying to trigger or foster that. Am I, do I have this right? Yes. Yes, thank you. So uh, Ignite is uh, feeding into this, build it and they will come ethic of the ethernet brand. Now let me end with one more observation unless you want to ask questions. We're way over. Do we have any time? Carry on. So Moore's Law. You heard on this stage from uh, Henry Samueli, who is uh, no dummy, that Moore's Law was about, had about 15 years to go. And uh, of course, then we all noticed that we'd heard this before. In fact, Gordon Moore used to say, we heard this story. Gordon Moore said it every few years, that we had 10 years to go. But here's what's true about Moore's Law. There's another um, part of the Ethernet brand which has to do with bandwidth elasticity. It's like the build it and they will come model. Every time we create more bandwidth, people use it and gobble it up. So there's elasticity. Uh, build more, more comes. What I observed in that discussion is that Moore's Law and bandwidth elasticity are the same thing. See, Moore's Law relates to Ethernet in two ways. Moore's Law creates the demand for bandwidth by making the machines all faster and want to do more, and therefore they need more bits to travel. And, and Moore's Law also enables us to build the networks to serve that traffic. So there's two ways in which Moore's Law inter, uh, interacts with this bandwidth elasticity. So what I think I learned from an uh, innovation point of view here was that, that uh, this, this bandwidth elasticity principle that we've relied on to build it and they will come, that'll end the day that Moore's Law ends. Moore's Law, no, I'm not saying Moore's Law will end in 15 years, but that whatever it ends and peaks out, then I think that's when we should begin to worry that the 
bandwidth elasticity will run out. So those are the collected thoughts I had from, uh, are there any questions or comments or, uh, yes sir? Alan Weisberger, IEEE Communication Society. I wonder if you could enlighten the audience about what I believe are two crucial aspects uh, of the history of Ethernet that were not covered in this conference. The first is the five or so years it took you to get from three megabits to 10 megabits and what role Ron Crane played. And then the second one is the role that you played in making 3Com survive amongst all those uh, Ethernet startups, Ackerman, Bass, and, and Cisco, and so forth, yeah. in the mid-1980s. Well, Ron Crane, I, f I failed to mention his name already. Uh, Ron Crane is a unsung, relatively unsung hero. I nominated uh, Ron and uh, Jeff, and they got an award that uh, IEEE Santa Clara Valley section uh, gave them a couple of months ago. Well, uh, yeah, Tat and Dave, but I had nominated the two of you. So, um, so maybe Ron is just a little bit sung, but he deserves to be sung more. I am reluctant to say this with Dave Boggs sitting in the room, but Ron Crane sort of picked up where Dave Boggs uh, let off. I invited Dave to join 3Com Corporation. He decided to stay in research, so uh, Ron Crane joined 3Com Corporation and sort of picked up the mantle. And then he was the one who led in the bringing of, from 3Com's point of view, the bringing of Ethernet to the IEEE. So for example, he worked on uh, Twisted Pair and, oh, he's the guy who built the, uh, most of the first Etherlink. The Etherlink was the first uh, network interface controller for the IBM PC, which was enabled by a chip called the Seek chip. And Ron sort of was the key chief engineer of that. Kill, that was a killer product. That took us from hundreds of units a month to millions of units a month. Uh, Dave Boggs, you want to say something kind about uh, Ron Crane? Ron is, uh, has forgotten more elect uh, electrical engineering than I ever knew. Um, he was exactly the right person to help you take, uh, take Ethernet to the next level. So. Uh, um, my you were really lucky. My principal contribution at 3Com Corporation was to keep the company from firing Ron. Well, occasionally, uh, you know, we had adult supervision in our company and, uh, you know, who dressed well and showed up at meetings on time and, and uh, they would... I am referring to the ceiling tile story, so... I'd, actually, I think the lightning story is better, but, the, but I could tell you the ceiling. So we had the Etherlink. Have I mentioned that the Etherlink was the company that was the product that really made 3Com Corporation from hundreds to millions a month? And Ron was building it. We, were putting the, we had put the Ethernet transceiver, which was Ron's specialty, right on the card. So there was all this analog passive stuff mixed in with the digital stuff. And Ron had the card, and manufacturing was waiting for the specs so they could build them. And we had already announced it, and Businessland was planning to sell it to all these PC owners. And, and Ron was working on it in his cubicle. So they kept sending me, go, go find out what Ron's doing. So I would go visit Ron, and, and one day I walked in, and uh, he had all these instruments in his cubicle, and the, and the ceiling tiles right above his office had been flipped over. And what Ron was doing was measuring the sound reflectivity of the ceiling tiles. He wasn't actually focused on working on the Etherlink as our cash was dwindling towards zero in the market. And uh, Ron, Ron, the Etherlink, not the ceiling tiles. He says, well, the sound is annoying me, and I'm sure it annoys everyone else in our company, and I think we need some work on this, and I've detected that the reflective, you chose the, you, Bob, chose the wrong ceiling tiles for this building, and uh, we uh, need to get new ones. So I agreed on the spot that we would get new ceiling tiles, and then as an interim measure, we would flip them over to expose the hairy side, which also absorbs sound. So we flip them over to get Ron to go back and focus on the Etherlink so that we get it out. Yes, Dave. 
Ron is really, the, uh, as far as I'm concerned, the inventor of 100 megabit Ethernet, too. Um, uh, let's see if I can remember. The, um. Yeah, but before that, the lightning thing happened. Uh, I've can so you first. After we got him back on the Etherlink, he'll deny all of this, by the way. But after we got him back on the Etherlink, still the card wasn't being handed over to manufacturing. So they sent me in again to find out what was going on. And uh, Ron was finishing up the uh, circuit that would uh, protect the Etherlink from lightning strikes. But I point out to Ron that in the, uh, in the uh, marketing resor uh, re uh, requirements document that we had carefully written for the Etherlink, there was no mention of lightning. Our customers had never mentioned they wanted lightning protection on the Etherlink. But Ron wanted to have lightning protection. And Ron gets what he wants. So he delayed release to manufacturing even more. And we, everyone was pulling their hair out. And finally, he handed in the card, and we made them, and people bought them. And one of the groups that bought them was a huge bank in uh, New York City with a tall skyscraper. And they bought like a 1,000 of our cards, which is the biggest order we'd ever received. But they were shrewd. They also bought a 1,000 of our competitors' cards. And they filled their building with both sets of cards. And get you know now what happened next. Lightning struck the building and fried all of our competitors' cards, and ours kept working. Whereupon we received an order for another thousand cards. Let me just finish the story about Ron and 100 megabit Ethernet. Um, back in the early 90s, uh, Ron Crane and I and Howard Charney and, and others were um, meeting regularly, trying to think up an idea and start a company. Um, and uh, after many interminable meetings, we sort of reluctantly decided on an idea of mine, which was to, to build some Ethernet test gear for uh, IT guys to diagnose problems. So we were sitting around um, Larry Birnbaum's kitchen table, I think, one, one morning, and uh, meeting again about the idea. and, and uh, I forget who said it, but somebody said, y you know, this isn't really very sexy. You know, can't we make it go faster? And I said, well, no, you, you've got speed of light problems with collision detection and all that. And I explained it again. And then Ron sort of quietly said, well, actually, that's not a problem anymore. Uh, and he explained that um, uh, somebody else was going, oh, right, uh, F, uh, what? Yeah, but there was there was uh, somebody else was doing 100 megabit. Uh, no, 100 no, no, megabits. The, the big difference was that we had no, designed Ethernet granted. to go a kilometer. Oh, it was FDDI. It was CDDI. That's right. He had been consulting on the adaptive equalization of a chip to run copper distributed 100 megabit Ethernet, 100 megabit FDDI over copper, and he, he figured it out and solved it. He said it's a pro it's not a problem. They can go 100 meters over over category five cable at, at 100 megabits per second. Problem is solved. All you need now is switches, and and so Howard looked at everybody and ran for the ran for the bleachers with that, and that became Grand Junction Network. Thanks, David. The second question had to do with how did uh, three com given that everybody had access to three uh, Ethernet technology, how did three com win in those days? It's very simple. Uh, we had a time machine, and we had, uh, the group of us had gone into the future at Xerox Park, <laughs> and we'd lived there for eight years, and we knew what the future looked like. And then in 1979, we flew back into the present, and we knew what the future was going to be, and it was buildings full of PCs, whereas Ralph Ungerman and company and others uh, who were f a little further ahead in other dimensions they were much too practical, and they used Ethernet, for example, to do dumb terminal uh, concentration and switching, whereas 3Com Corporation knew that the future was not terminal concentration, the future was personal computers, so we focused on doing PCs. Then when the PCs came in August of 81, with the IBM PC principally, uh, we had a card that plugged into it, and they didn't, because they had been focused on you know, shorter term, more practical things, and they had not had the benefit 
of the time machine. They didn't know what the future was going to look like. So what did you think about 100VG Anilan and what is the feeling about FDDI also? I didn't understand the sorry, question. Sorry. sorry. <coughs> VG Anilan? Well, there was a big catastrophe surrounding that. Uh, the Hewlett Packard Company, from which many of the employees of 3Com had come, uh, a fine company, especially now that 3Com has acquired it. <laughs> the, uh, they developed a thing called, v, uh, they eventually called it VG Anyland, but it was, they were starting out by calling it Ethernet, fast Ethernet, or a, a version, another version of fast Ethernet. The word Ethernet had been associated with this technology, and I was a columnist for InfraWorld at that time, and I had to write an opinion every week 605 words by, you know, Thursday night. So I one week wrote, this new technology from the Hewlett Packard Company probably works and is perfectly fine, but it is not Ethernet. And I'm in charge of what's Ethernet and what's not Ethernet, and that is not Ethernet. You know, a snarky column. The, whereupon the next day, the Hewlett Packard Company canceled all advertising with all the publications of the International Data Group for all time. And uh, and I called up Mr. McGovern, who owns IDG, and I apologized for my column. And Mr. McGovern said, I read your column. It was perfectly fine. They'll be back. And uh, two days later, they were. So I think, but VDG Inland's gone now, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. It pro and it was a fine technology. It, um, it wasn't? Jeff doesn't think it was. VG, VG AnyLAN couldn't do full duplex, uh, which became the discerning difference when the market moved to 100 meg. Hubs went away, switches came in, with switches came full duplex, and VG AnyLAN was a half duplex technology. It went away very quickly. Thank you. There, that's just the beginning of the problems with VG Anyland, but it's. <laughs> uh, uh, I walked out of my fair share of meetings when they were trying to propose that, but it just leave it alone. It 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 never got anywhere. It wasn't a great idea. Um, the the other thing to note why uh, fast Ethernet, hundred megabit Ethernet was was sort of like falling off a rock, easy to do. As as you heard me mention before, uh, we had uh, four semiconductor chip efforts underway. And at that time, we thought, gee, with the current CMOS process, with no tweaks or special binning or anything, what if in the simulation we just run it the, the exact d design at a higher speed, clock speed? Well, what, would, what speed would it be? And by, by just closing your eyes and changing a parameter in the simulation, it was 80% of the way to 100 megabits by doing nothing. And so we said, oh, there will instantaneously be 10 100 chips. With, without doing, we don't even have to do a new CMOS process or binning or any special thing. And so it really was the you know, water flows downhill the easy way and in the obvious way. And, and that was, uh, made it inevitable. Moore's Law. Moore's Law, well, <laughs> this in particular uh, was, was just drafting on that. It, it wasn't yeah, advancing but... Moore's Law. It, it just, you know, it happened when it was possible to happen. And that, that is the, the, the continual message. It was the beauty and simplicity of the CSMA CD design that made that scale up possible, don't you think, Bill? Other questions? Is it? Oh, are we done? Thank you very much. <laughs>